Hi. Um, so I'm going to teach this course um, mainly about geometry and then about Rhino uh, as well. Um, I like to kind of bounce around to all the different parts of Rhino rather than going deep and learning every single tool in one part, because I think if you know a little bit about everything in this YouTube Google era, if you understand what can be done and a little bit about how to do one or two things, then it's quite easy to search your way or to find all those extra tools. So the five weeks of this course are gonna jump between the major areas of Rhino, um, different types of geometry that I kind of cover in this introduction. Uh, and then we'll, uh, I'll do some slides at the beginning of this uh, lecture today and introduce the kind of 3D design as a sort of whole and then onto Rhino uh, and we'll like learn how to use the software. Um, if you haven't downloaded the software, uh, I presume you have at this stage, but there's a, a 90 day free trial um, of Rhino 7. Some of you may be using Rhino 5 or 6 or Mac version. Um, the Mac version is slightly different in terms of its layout, same tools, but just slightly different layout. Um, and that's that. So I love this project, um, which kind of gets a little bit started about me. I was in London in 2008, working at a sort of large corporate architecture practice that does many of the world's tallest buildings. And they had extra budget, I guess, to do cool projects. And they had within the office, this group of people called the Smart Geometry Unit that were also in other of the sort of large, big skyscraper architects. And one of them was sort of a, had just finished his PhD from MIT and others had studied in London at the Architecture Association or AA in the DRL program. And the DRL is the Design Research Lab. And this was a sort of uh, a project they did in 2008 to just show what they had learned in this sort of second master's program uh, in London. And it kind of differentiates what, how I think about design software and geometry, because my undergraduate degree was uh, hand-drawn. We, we, we did drawings for architecture by hand. If we did perspectives, we set up um, sort of fading points and, and li did lots of lines and lots of measurements on, on the paper. And when I went to London, I was sort of immersed in this world of digital geometry. And I think when many of the people from my undergrad learned AutoCAD, they were doing the exact same things people had done for decades in that they weren't using the software to do anything new. And I think that gave them a lot of frustration because the, some of the professors liked drawing by hand because they weren't really doing anything on the computer that you couldn't do by hand. Um, Rhino and other softwares that we'll cover or kind of introduce really do do new things. And that sort of sets up this change from what you can do on pen and paper and what you can do with mathematics and algorithms. And that's sort of an old and then new. And I think many people know AutoCAD or other drafting softwares and they aren't really doing anything new with it. So in this course, we're gonna sort of cover what's new in geometry and why you would need this software or can use the software to do those new things. So as a basic introduction, starting at the very beginning of all computer graphics, I just like to um, explain the sort of origin story. Um, if on the left, we have a grid of 30 by 30 squares and we label some black and some white, we can kind of draw a circle or something that's recognizable as a circle. Um, this is sort of a pixel model of, of drawing. And uh, on the right-hand side, we have uh, a precise measurement with a center point at 15 and 15 and a radius of eight. Um, on the left-hand side, we call this raster graphics and all photographs, um, many of you are probably familiar with this stuff, but all photographs are raster graphics where each of those uh, squares is colored a different color and uh, 3000 by 3000 squares would be nine million pixels or nine megapixels. When you zoom in on raster graphics, they will always fade to this grid. The grid is sort of always there. It might be just really, really small. On the right-hand side, vector graphics are mathematically defined. Uh, therefore, if you zoom in on it, it will always be a crisp edge. The major two softwares for 2D drawing for graphic designers, and I guess I've done use them a lot, but are Photoshop and Illustrator. And they, they create them as separate softwares because they really are two different giants, two different sort of underlying ways they work. When we look at 3D, the same is true. Um, voxels are pixels, it, volumetric pixels, uh, uh, and 
they are sort of 3D pixels. And on the right, we have mathematically defined uh, shapes that can be more accurate. They contain a lot on all sort of vector drawing compared to raster drawing. Uh, vector drawings are far more efficient when it comes to a file type as well. There's a lot less polygonal points defined in the model. Therefore, there's just a lot less geometry. There's a lot less uh, 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 tiny file sizes as a relative comparison. The major voxel program that you may know or game is Minecraft. In this, the whole world is defined by physical blocks and transparent blocks that you can walk through. And some of them are textured as grass and some are wood and some are stone, but they are all uh, just an entire grid of cubes and you can kind of manipulate them as you want. And it's sort of, because you're able to manipulate them in the game, it is in a way a 3D design software if you were to kind of use it to create geometry. Uh, another form of uh, voxel geometry is MRI scans. They take uh, uh, images through the body at, at sort of set intervals, and then you can make 3D models out of the geometry that you do through an MRI scan. This is a project I did just on ornament and uh, voxels, where we this is human uh, body made through symmetry and tidied up in Rhino, um, taught by Tobias Klein. But it shows sort of learning about other types of geometry. For vector geometry, mathematical geometry, we might split them again, subdivide them into two, and come up with surface and solid. So we can make a sphere in both types of geometry, but in one it is hollow and in the other one it's solid. And that's quite different for if we were to take a bite out of each of those, what the resulting geometry would be if we were to bite out of them. Uh, solid programs generally are popular with engineers, um, particularly a program called SolidWorks another one called Creo. They tend to be really, really expensive, um, 5,000 plus or 4,000 plus dollars uh, to buy. Um, they do things that surface geometry can't do. Um, and then some of the surface geometry sort of fakes it way to be solid when you want it to be, which we'll cover in this course. But Rhino is a surface geometry software. Therefore, all geometry you create, it thinks is hollow. That's its back end. Uh, one of the big problems with solid geometry um, so, or people who are very used to using solid geometry software is filleting solids or kind of cutting away solids. So if you were to do the uh, digital equivalent of using a router bit to cut away the edge as you would do with this wood, that's quite easy in SolidWorks. In Rhino, it just becomes a bit of a hassle, but uh, you can kind of do it in there. Surface geometry is then further subsplit into a couple of different types. And NURBS, non-uniform rational beast lines, not something you need to know, but is a type of mathematical modeling. And I'll come to that one last. Mesh modeling or polygonal modeling is where we have points defined in 3D space. And we have flat geometry, straight lines between the points. So we can do a quad mesh or a triangular mesh. Um, that's more of a mathematical problem to which type of mesh we'd want to do. But um, there is no curved geometry in that sphere. Therefore, that sphere will never truly be round. We can simulate it as round, but its underlying geometry will always be these flat faceted pieces. And on the right, we have subdivision geometry. And that's a sort of variant kind of between the two, but more on uh, polygonal model, mesh model where we have points in 3D space, we have flat planes between those uh, uh, points. We need sort of less points. And when we smooth it in the software, you end up with this, in Rhino it's tab on, tab off, but you end up with these patches. So in all forms of 3D software, having too much geometry is really hard to edit because we just want one point and to pull it and the things to happen. If we have a hundred points, which point do we grab? And it becomes really hard. So you're always looking to have as little geometry to control the shape that you want and not really much more. So meshes are kind of a little harder to work with. They have different kind of tools that are a little like sculpture where you push on them and it pushes all the points in slightly, but more towards the center. Um, they tend to be more around gaming. So low poly is gaming, high poly is more animation. Um, subdivision modeling is also associated with animation. Nerves modeling, kind of like the vector circles is efficient from a file size perspective, but more importantly, between the polygonal points, there can be curves. 
And mathematical modeling does not need the shapes between each of the points to be flat, they can be curved. And as a result, we can be far more precise with the type of geometry we create. And if we're gonna engineer these products or build them in the real world, um, we really wanna be accurate with the shapes that we're creating. So I would, or kind of generally thought of as polygonal modeling is fast and um, very useful for animation, uh, but NERVS is where all, or solid or surface mathematical modeling is where all engineering, architecture, jewelry, anything that's gonna be made physical, because you want what you draw on the screen to be at least somewhat accurate in the product that you finally make. So um, one of the offices I refer to OMA, uh, quite a famous office, and it, they work a lot with blue foam models. And blue foam is cut using a hot wire cutter. So you just sort of that's hot wire and you push the foam through it. And I really think the tools that you use, uh, the final geometries you create kind of are dependent on those tools. So the blue foam models, you can almost recognize the buildings, even though this is not a building made from blue foam, it's still the geometry that was created using a blue foam prototyping method. When you look at this final project by uh, Zahadid in uh, Azerbaijan, um, it was very clearly kind of a subdivision model uh, on, a, on, a, on a computer. And I kind of knowing all the tools and a range of softwares, start to look at buildings or any physical product and I'll kind of have a fairly good guess what software they use to design it and have a fairly good guess what specific tools they might have used to get there. So, it, it, and hopefully it will become kind of obvious to all of you as well. Um, if they're used. The first uh, 3D model uh, ever created was using Bezier curves and we'll cover different types of curves next week. But this was the Utah teapot where Martin Newell was doing his PhD in Utah and they created this mathematical modeling, 3D modeling, and they didn't know what uh, model they'd send around the world to say we did it. They were going to send a pyramid or a cube. And his wife said, why don't you send our teapot? And they modeled this teapot and it's the first file ever sent. So it's kind of the hello world of 3D. And when people are testing their rendering settings, they still use this teapot as a sort of token. Uh, it appears as references in a lot of uh, 3D things. There was a music video that did it and, and Simpsons did it when Homer went into 3D. Toy Story, you see it here. Um, also Andy, the character in uh, Toy Story is possibly named after Andy Van Damme and on Andy's bookshelf is Visual Programming by Andy Van Damme, which no kid that age would have. Uh, he's a professor, famous professor at Brown University on computer graphics. And Toy Story used the first Toy Story, which is 1995. There's a Scud the dog. And the first Toy Story was done in mathematical modeling. It was done in NURBS. And as a result, it's, it's not uh, great for these kind of very fluid and flexible and smooth shapes. So uh, Scud has no fur. Um, some of the zoomed up shots look pretty bad. Uh, and as you kind of see Pixar evolve every single uh, film they made, there's sort of giant leaps in, in sort of the geometry uh, for each one. Um, fur is possible by the time of uh, Monsters, Inc. Uh, and this is sort of um, the animation process for uh, uh, Pixar. I just found something online. It may or may not be accurate. It's just from the core post. But they used Autodesk Maya for 3D modeling uh, geometry. Then they uh, probably set the materials in Maya, I guess, and they do the rigging in model Maya. So rigging is uh, this process that you'll see here where the face, as I said before, you want the least amount of geometry to do all of your control. So you have these uh, kind of rigs that uh, you can move the eyebrows up and down. And when they're setting the animation, they, they're just really moving the character rigs, which all the hundreds of thousands of political points are controlled by the rigs. So in that way, you're controlling the, the whole process. And Pixar use a whole range of other softwares, Presto being their in-house software that doesn't get outside their office and you can't buy commercially. In sort of an architecture process, you might do the modeling in Rhino. Uh, material lighting rendering are usually done out of house if you're, if you're to do professional stuff with firms like Lexagon or Hayes Davison, where you're sort of 5,000 pounds per image or some price like that. And, um, but ultimately you're gonna do 3D modeling, draw the geometry, then kind of like setting meta information, you're gonna set those materials, which is sort of setting the color, the texture, maybe with the JPEG, 
um, then setting the glossiness, the opacity, the um, if, if it's water or glass, the refractive index, and kind of you just draw any shape you want, and then you set these settings, and it becomes that material. Then they would somebody else would do the lighting for the model. Rendering takes up to a day or two days on, on a computer to to really get the high quality renders out. And in architecture, they might insert that back into a photograph, a sort of aerial photograph taken by a drone, um, to make it really photorealistic. Another thing you could do is do 3D modeling and then just export the line work uh, to a sort of Illustrator. Um, Rhino, one of the best things about Rhino is it has tons of files types that you can import into it and tons of file types that you can export from it. So this would, um, this is big architects uh, in uh, Copenhagen and um, I know the process very well, worked in the sort of other office um, in Copenhagen that used to be the same office. And that would be 3D modeled in Rhino, exported and brought into Adobe Illustrator. And that's just making the line work nice, maybe coloring it a little bit, adding arrows. And this is um, a proposal for a really fun hotel that was, you could ski on the roof to learn how to ski and then go up the slope, which is that green slope or red slope, depending on what side you wanted to ski down on the roof. Another thing to use uh, 3D geometry for is you would model something in Rhino. Um, when I was in college, we learned a program called Ecotect, which was bought by Autodesk, but I've never used this Ladybug Honeybee, but it's a plugin for Rhino that does, looks like it does the same thing, where you 3D model the geometry. Um, these softwares generally know you, you input the city, it knows where the sun is at every single time of the year, and it shows you exactly how much light is going to get in through each window in each direction. If you model all the surrounding buildings, it will take account for shadows and you can see the shadows throughout the year and really plan the size of your windows based on the feedback that you would make in these kind of models. And just on plugins, Rhino has tons of plugins, uh, a lot of uh, a very strong online community for asking questions to in the form of forums or uh, sometimes the software developers themselves get involved and answer your questions. Uh, there's a lot of YouTube videos, so that there's really a, a great community to learn new skills beyond the introduction. Uh, this is uh, my own uh, machine, um, which is a CNC machine. And on this, you're kind of drawing uh, furniture in as a line work and then bringing it into a CAM software and telling the tool path to follow the paths that were created in Rhino and press go and, and out comes furniture. So uh, all of these softwares will have uh, XYZ uh, coordinates and in Rhino and in SolidWorks and anything that we're making physical products, the Z axis is vertical. In film software, they think of X and Y as the screen where Y is vertical and Z is off the screen. So if you are ever using any of those softwares, you might need to reset it. You can always reset the XYZ to anything you want it to be. The, Origin point, or 000, is um, uh, uh, on Rhino, we're, we're, we're gonna sort of insert the units when we open the model. So we don't need any units after we tell the program what units we're gonna use. Um, they can be light years, they can be millimeters, they can be nanometers, they can be whatever you want or inches. Um, but after that point, the software is just gonna think in zero, 10, 100, 000. It, it just wants numbers, it doesn't wanna know those dimensions afterwards. If you're going to print a page or uh, export a 3D print, it might be useful to know whether you're in millimeters or light years because that's potentially gonna have problems. But um, we're gonna sort of insert coordinates in, in the format of X comma Y comma Z uh, and no punctuation at the end. So if we want a point and we're asked the position of the point, we're gonna put three comma three comma three. Um, all geometry, I'm just going to go through the types of geometry in Rhino and then we'll jump into the software. Um, so points is the smallest unit of uh, Rhino and everything in Rhino, whether you draw it or, or draw something more complicated, is composed of points. So it's sort of the electron or the, the, the smallest unit in the, in the software. A curve, oh, also just note that a point is PT, uh, and knowing the shorthand abbreviations of each of these is particularly useful um, for using the software efficiently. 
Uh, a curve is any line, whether it is curved or not curved, just all lines are called curves, and their shorthand is C or V. Um, there are a few different types of curves, but we're going to cover them next week. Um, a curve can be open, which just means it's open, and its selection uh, shorthand is, is open curve. Uh, if you're going to get into coving, the, the, the capital letters matter, but otherwise it's not so important. Uh, and then you can have a closed curve. A, a closed curve can become a surface. An open curve cannot because it doesn't can't finish off the geometry. Um, and a surface can be planar if it is flat, or it's called planar if it's flat, or it can be um, uh, sort of curvy. Then if you were to extrude that up, it would be a poly surface um, that could be open or closed. A closed poly surface means it is airtight. Um, that means uh, for 3D printing, you can only print closed poly surfaces. And if there is some bad geometry that somebody uh, left a nanometer open, that would be open geometry and the 3D printer just wouldn't see it. So um, knowing that closed uh, geometry is perfectly airtight closed is quite important. And there's closed poly surface and the abbreviation closed poly surface. So everything when you're drawing is some version of points, curves, or surfaces. Um, when Rhino thinks about solids, it's really just thinking about closed poly surfaces. Um, there's no true solid in Rhino, there's just closed poly surfaces. And most of the tools are going from one of these types up or down uh, to another one. So if you extrude a curve, it becomes a surface. If you extrude a surface, it becomes a poly surface. If you want to duplicate edges on the uh, surface or the poly surface, it becomes a curve. If you divide a curve, it becomes a point. So you're just moving up and down this ladder of geometry. And um, just to cover some tools, scale 1D is uh, what you can type into Rhino and, and you'll sort of scale it in one direction. Uh, Rhino has uh, a lot of the time if you type what you think it might be, uh, a lot of the time that is the name of the command and it just works. So if you just can't remember the name of something, just type it and when I'll show you when we open the software and it will probably work. And then a lot of the time there's more than one command or that does the exact same thing. So stretch and scale 1D will do the exact same thing, at least in this example. Scale 2D will move it in two dimensions and scale 3D will move it in three dimensions. So we're gonna open software now and I'm gonna draw this model, it's, it's quite a simple geometry, but I'm just gonna show you how to draw it. And there is my contact information that uh, if you need to contact me, we can ask questions, we'll figure that out. So this is the Rhino interface. So you see these four windows, maybe it might be better to start there, top, front, right, and perspective. Um, at the very top of the page is the file menu, and you can see the names of the weeks that I'm going to cover, curves, surfaces, sub D, solid. Each of those has various menus of every tool in the curve menu. There are each of the tools available as icons, which is repeating the information, but if you want to use icons as opposed to the file menu, you can do it that way. So we have curve tools here, surface tools, and changing that changes both the sidebar and this top bar, um, and solids, sub Ds standard. And down the bottom is all about accuracy. Um, so here we have uh, the snaps, which are currently grayed out because I need to click that O snap is turned on. And O snap should almost always be turned on. Planar should almost always be turned on. Um, when you download the software for the first time, they're off, so I, I deliberately turn them on. Ortho, we're going to turn on as well now. So planar is just, uh, if I'm in any view, and I draw a line that it will be at the same height uh, in all views. Um, if that's not on, sometimes the second point can be a thousand meters higher than the first point and it really messes things up. So planar should let's say, almost always be on. Ortho just means I will be locked to go vertical or horizontal in each view. Um, if you wanna make really curvy geometry, you need ortho to be off. But for now, let's just leave that on. 
And then OSNAP is our various snaps. And I'm gonna cover them when I, when I open up some geometry. The command line is the third option for how you could input commands into Rhino. Um, it's by far my favorite and pretty much the only thing I use, which I type in the commands. And if you just type box, box will be a command and you get a box. And if you type sphere, you get a sphere. If you type curve, you go from there. So um, the first thing we're gonna do uh, is change perspective view, um, the viewport menus. So it's quite normal to have top, front, and right, which are kind of like plan, section, and elevation um, as wireframe, which just means you can just see the lines. But for perspective view, we have the option of shaded, rendered, or ghosted, and a whole load more. But ghosted just means that this, if there are surfaces that we see them as shaded, and rendered means we will see it as a solid. Uh, so ghosted is generally what perspective uh, would be set to for modeling. And I'm gonna delete this box and draw it one more time. So, uh, from the menu on the left here, you can select uh, a box by left clicking it. Some of the commands, if you see this um, tooltip, that it shows that the, if I left click this one, I get hide objects. And if I right click, I get show objects. Um, so sometimes left and right click might uh, react differently with some of the tools, but doesn't, that's not true for all tools. And then if I hold down and left click, and I just hold down for like three or four seconds, this menu pops up with lots of types of solids. And if I click off, that disappears. But if I hold it down again and I drag it out, it becomes a sort of menu that stays there. And similarly, there's lots of different types of boxes. And that generally is if I wanted to draw a box, um, let's say if I wanted to draw a sphere, do I want to enter the center first and then the radius, or do I want to enter three points on the surface and just create the sphere to fit those three points or some other variant of them. So there's different starting points for how you want to, what, what kind of inputs you want to give it in order to get the geometry you want. So if I start by creating a, a box and from the command point, it will sort of ask me questions. And you always kind of want to add, look to that top left part of the screen to see what is it asking for um, so in this case, it's asking for the first corner of the base. If I was to left click on model, that would place the first corner of the base, but it would be a highly inaccurate way of doing it. It would just be like placing it randomly um, where I feel like it to be. If I type zero, zero, comma, zero, comma, zero, now the first corner is exactly on the origin point. Then it asks me a second question, other corner of base or length. So if I enter a number, that would be the length. If I enter another uh, number, comma, number, comma, number, that would be a, where the point in space. So I'm just gonna put 100. When you open the model, you'd be asked millimeters or light years or kilometers or whatever. The 100 is those units, but it really doesn't matter for this lecture what units you enter. And then with, uh, press enter to use length. So I enter the number 100 and you guys hopefully can see that 100 is entered there. I press enter and that's that. And then height, one more number, 100. So now I've created the cube, but I can't see it because I'm far too zoomed in. And you can select the cube and type zoom. And it's gonna give you a bunch of options. Uh, these uh, options that are kind of being highlighted are I can click on them or I can type them or I can type the first letter or the, the underlined letter. So I want to say extents, uh, but that only did perspective. So I can type zoom and click all, which is all views and extents. And now all four of my views zoom to the box that I just uh, created. So if I double click on any of these views, they become, um, uh, they take over the whole screen. And if I double click on them again, they go back to the, the four menu. 
So if I uh, zoom out, and um, if you have a, a, a three-point mouse wheel, that's particularly useful when modeling. Um, if not, you can use, I mean, if you get used to it, you can use a computer mouse. But um, if you move the mouse wheel up and down, that's going to zoom in and out of your model. Um, if you have a laptop mouse, two fingers up, down, zoom in and out of a model. So that's uh, important to do. Um, right click and hold will uh, orbit around a model. And right click and holding shift and holding right click and moving it will pan the model. So kind of like just pushing across like this. They are different if I double click on perspective and I go to any of these views. Um, I'm not going to orbit in a top view or a front view, but I would need to pan. So right click in this case would be pan um, to just kind of drag the model left or right, I'll pan. Um, uh, two fingers up, down, or the click wheel will zoom in and out of the model like that. And again, I can just click the model, zoom all. And I could type selected or extends because I have it selected. Uh, get that. So if I try to create uh, another shape, um, let's do a pyramid. So we have this menu that we sort of lifted earlier. And it's going to, number of sides is one of the options. It's currently set to five. If I click that, it says, how many do you want? And four for a pyramid. And it wants the center of the pyramid. Um, if I do this method. Um, so if I draw a line quickly uh, across there, which is left click for each one, and right click to complete the command. So it's like left click to in insert the geometry, right click to complete the command, and then right click when I'm not uh, doing anything is going to repeat the command. So that's repeat the last command. So I can go that way as well. So now I have the center of this box if I need it for this pyramid. So I'm going to left click the pyramid. It wants the center. We have the number of sides set to four here. We could change a whole bunch of other options as well, but it's not bother. And we can select that midpoint. And, and it wants us to select a corner and then select the end, which is the height, which I just want to enter 100. So it's sort of balanced. So now we have a pyramid on top of a cube. Um, I want to talk about these uh, snaps now, uh, which are the O snaps. Um, if you don't have snaps on, uh, it, it means that you might think you're clicking the corner or the top of a pyramid, but you're actually just one millionth of an inch to the left, left, um, or you're just slightly off. Um, when I was working in big architecture firms that had a lot of younger members of staff, um, a lot of them did not have snaps on. A lot of the geometry was almost perfect, but if you zoomed in, was actually all over the place. The, the, the squares weren't perfectly square and, and it was really annoying. So having snaps on and having the right snaps on is really important. So there are several types, end, near, point, mid, center, intersect, perspective are the big ones. After that, they kind of uh, fade off in their relevance. If endpoint is on, any type of geometry will snap to the endpoint of any geometry. If that endpoint is not selected, it will not get there. See, it says near, which is telling us what snap it's doing. And that would be an example. If I, if I was to start that, that that is not perfectly on that corner. Only if end is on will it snap to an endpoint. Near means it will snap to a uh, a curve, just on the curve, but not the end point. So if that was off, now I'm not even snapping, snapping to the line. I'm just snapping anywhere in space near there. Um, so my new geometry would be quite random. Um, so that will snap to a center point of a pyramid or a circle of centers on uh, and midpoint uh, as well. Uh, point is if there are any points in the model or um, yeah, just if there's any points in the model, which you kind of create at times um, for stuff. If you have two curves and you're intersecting and want to meet at the intersection, that's that can be on. Um, 
and perpendicular is useful as well. But I, I leave most of them on most of the time. And then O snap uh, down the bottom will either turn all snaps off or all snaps on. Um, there are times when you kind of you want to create very organic geometry and, and you want the snaps to get out of your way. So um, if I have this pyramid, I can zoom in on different views. This is the right view and the front view. Um, mirror is a, a regular command. And in Rhino, I just type mirror and it works. So it, it asks me for the start of the mirror reflection. And it's going to snap to the end point. And it tells me that it's both an end point and an intersection point. Um, that's fine. I want it to snap to that point. And because I have ortho on, it's only going to go horizontal. And it's going to mirror the geometry, creating another pyramid, exact same size. Uh, if I went from that side, it would create that way. So now I have this uh, facing pyramid. And um, I can't remember what this uh, sculpture thing is. And I'm just going to create anything I want. But um, so now we can just create other types of geometry that we can uh, center. So let's do a cylinder. Uh, we don't have a midpoint. Oh, we do actually we have a center point that we can snap to. So you're always kind of looking to get a, a, a center point. So left click to begin. Uh, then it asks me for the radius. If I get a midpoint here, I can just snap to that. And then it asks me for end of cylinder, which is the height. And I just put 100 and it will be a matching side. So I hope you'll be able to follow along this video when it gets uploaded or um, presume you can't follow along as I'm doing this talk. But um, follow along and then ask any questions. Uh, and I'll be available to answer questions anytime you want during the week. I have to figure out where we're going to ask them. So now that we have our kind of geometry, we can orbit around it. We can zoom in and out of it. Um, we want to sort of keep our model organized. So when the software is open by default, it uh, does not have layers and uh, layers and um, with properties on. So it, it sort of initially creates them as this sort of pop-up menu. If you sort of drag it and kind of needs to be dragged from the left side of it, it will snap to the um, left-hand side of the screen. You may need to sort of pull it out by just uh, hovering over these lines and left click drag it to make it wider. And you can left click drag any of these as well, just if you want it. Um, so everything is on this current layer called default. Um, this little file here creates new layers and we can move or create, let's say five new layers. And having layers uh, on helps sort of put different objects on different layers to hide them or to lock them so that they're not snappable. If you have thousands of objects in your model, it really helps to be able to just work on a tiny part of it at any given time and not have uh, thousands of polygonal points that are all going to uh, be snappable. Because if I have, if, if you see, if I'm trying to, even just with a small amount of geometry, that I'm trying to snap to that bottom corner, it's kind of snapping to all these points near there. So I want as little geometry in the model so that my snap goes to the exact point I want it to. Because if it goes to the wrong point, my geometry is going to be all wrong, and I'm going to have to go back and recreate it. So um, left click selects any object we want. Uh, and this colorful circle is the layer properties. So this shows us that this, all the details of this object shows us that this is currently on the default layer. And we can move that to layer one. And then move the, the sort of bottom pyramid to layer two, the top pyramid to layer three, and so on. So clicking this, I don't know what this is actually meant to be. It looks like kind of a pie with a blue, white, and red layer, a slice of pie or something. Um, we have the option of the light bulbs beside each layer and the lock symbol and this black uh, square. The black square is the color of the layer. Um, and this is just for modeling purposes only. 
if I render this model, it looks red here, but it's still uh, not, it has no material. It, it does not have a red material. This is just for modeling. Um, so if I click the lock layer, that locks layer one, which is our red one, and if I click align, uh, it still will snap to that layer, but I can't select it. I can't move it. I, it just sort of stays in the background. And if I turn the light off, it, it disappears. And if I turn the light on, it comes back. So hiding geometry um, that's still in the model, it's not deleted, is one way of focusing on exactly what you want. Um, and if I click this uh, pyramid, if I, if I wanted to just work on this or select just the two pyramids, um, I would click, I could type isolate and it isolates everything that's not locked. But, okay, so isolate again. And now I just have a, the, the other stuff is still very much in my 3D model space. It's just currently disappeared. Control Z in Rhino um, has an enormous memory. It can be manually edited in the settings, but um, you can click it many, many times and it will undo the hide. If we type unhide, it will unhide uh, all objects. I think it's unhide. Yeah. Or show, sorry. It's show. Yeah, show three hidden objects. And those menus are this light bulb. You can see the left click is hide, the right click is show. And if I left click and hold it, I get the menu. I can drag that out. The, uh, third one shows selected objects, and the fourth one is isolated, isolate objects. So that, that isolate button is this fourth one if we wanted to click it. And then we can just close this and close this. So I'm just going to show all, and let's just make this back up again. So, um, when um, when dragging or to move an object um, and to rotate an object and to scale an object, um, they are done by just typing in move, rotate, scale. Um, there's always multiple ways, so they are, so I'm not sure even where they are because I, I never find them in the menus because it's just a very slow process. But you can find move, rotate, scale over here. It's probably here somewhere as well. But, um, if I, uh, I left click an object and type move, and then it says point, where do I want it to move it from? And I left, left click this bottom corner and point I want to move it to, and I left click this other corner, it will precisely move it uh, by that distance. Uh, if I was to have it selected and type move and select the point to move from and then type it distance, but um, I'm just going to like hold or kind of move it either slightly along the X or slightly along the Y. And as long as it's sort of in that direction and then type 100 and it's sort of set in that direction and type enter, uh, it's sort of locked there and, and one left click to finish and it's done. So that's one another way of doing it. Uh, in Rhino, and I just want to sort of make this point that it's, in many cases, it doesn't matter what order you do things, which makes the software really nice to use because um, some softwares that are order specific don't work when you try to get them to do it. So if I was to type move without having anything selected, it would then just ask me on the top left corner, select objects to move. Then I select the object and I press enter, and then I'm back to the point that I moved it on from. So, you can have the object selected first, or you can select it later. It really doesn't matter. But you're always looking to this top left menu for what kind of instructions does it does the software want me to do? So um, I'd normally I haven't done online teaching before, but I'd normally sort of set these tasks for you to do, and then see how you're doing, and then just add more uh, tools later. But we're just going to cover few more tools um, for the last 10 minutes. Um, so if you want to know the distance of something, type distance and that will work. Also kind of like um, Google's prediction uh, when you type a search thing, if you just type a few letters, it will show you every command in Rhino that it thinks you're trying to find. And sometimes if you kind of half remember a command, 
Um, you can kind of just type a few letters and see what's available. Um, also, uh, so if we type distance, so just uh, type the first point and then type the second point. It says that distance is 100 millimeters, which everything I'm doing right now is 100 millimeters. Because I use this uh, top area a lot, I usually drag this down so I can see um, more of it. Um, this is the history of everything I've done. So I can just sort of see the last few commands and there's a scroll thing here. So I can actually scroll up the full history of every single thing that I've done. It does remember a lot of history. Uh, again, that can be manually edited in settings. But, uh, so um, you can kind of see on this left-hand menu, um, the curves, different types of curves, then different types of surfaces, then different types of solids, um, and then join and explode. So if I type explode to a polysurface, that would turn it into all of the uh, surfaces that made it up. So you can see that that is now uh, all these different surfaces. And selecting them, if I'm selecting multiple objects from a distance, it gives me a pop-up menu for the different surfaces. And if they were surfaces, curves, it would say surface, curve, point, whatever. And if they were on different layers, it would show what layer they're on. And it kind of makes it slightly easier to select, but if you have too much geometry, it's near impossible. But it does add um, and how much it helps you sort of select this. And then if I select them all again um, and type join, it joins surfaces and makes them back into uh, a polysurface. Um, and then since we're going to do move, rotate, and scale, um, rotate and make sure you're rotate and not rotate 3D. I'll, sh I'll show you both, but rotate is a sort of flat rotation. Um, if I set a point um, in the top menu, and you can kind of see that if, if I select any point, it's going to select that point in all the views. So that top, top of the cube, the selected cube point in perspective, it's selected in the top view, but I wouldn't know uh, if it's that point or that point. So you kind of need to look at multiple views to see which point is being selected. And that's why snaps and everything is important that you're selecting the right points. Um, so if I want to rotate around the origin point, I can select this bottom corner because that's the origin point. Uh, and then I just need to left click. It's asking for the sort of first reference point. And then it's going to ask me the second reference point, and it's going to rotate 90 degrees. Uh, again, if I left click the first corner, and I sort of set the second corner, and then I just type uh, 30, it would go 30 degrees, and I can make sort of very accurate rotations that way. Rotate 3D um, is going to have an extra step in it. So it wants to select the object to rotate. Uh, I left click the object, and I press Enter when done. The rotational axis in this time, in this case, I'm going to select this um, line here as the rotational axis. Then the first reference point, I'm going to select this point here, and now it's going that way around. So I can, um, and if I'm selecting very um, obscure axes, I can sort of rotate um, beyond the orth orthogonal geometry. But, uh, That'll be that one, and Control C will undo that. Um, duplicate is um, another important command. So DUP is the shorthand for duplicate, and duplicate edge is the command of how I would go from a surface back to a curve. So that just selects that one curve, and if I press Enter, and then I move it out, uh, you can see that that's now a curve. And then if uh, SEL is the other useful one, I'm going to give you guys a, um, a sort of grammar uh, or vocabulary a sheet that has all of these shorthands for these commands. Um, so it's just, you just, I mean, there's not that many when you get used to them, I'll just duplicate, uh, select, expose, join, so on. 
So you can select all objects with SCL all. You could select just the curves in the model by select SEL CRV. Um, sorry, I've got everything selected. SEL CRV, um, but I'd select just the curves in the model. And if I had the curves and I didn't want them, I could do SEL CRV and then delete, which I'm going to do because I don't want them. So that is um, most of what I want to cover today. Um, one other just little trick that's kind of important is if I am moving stuff, um, um, you can just left click and drag, but this is a, a sort of inaccurate drag that now I have nowhere to reference that to say it's precisely on the origin point or 100 millimeters from the origin point. It's just a random distance now because I just dragged it. But if I was to do move, uh, which I can type M enter or move enter. And I select this bottom corner point. And then once the point that I can move to, but I control click on any point, that's not gonna select the final point. It's gonna select that point in 3D and then lock it to that vertical axis. And then I can type a height above that point. So that's sort of move, select object, bottom corner, and then control click this bottom corner. So left click, control, and then left click, and then slot. And then I could type 50, and it would be exactly 50 meters, 50 mil, or whatever my units are. Um, through there. So the aim of this lecture is really just to create the shape in um, in the model, that's the sort of graphic that I, I don't think this is going to show you. Okay, there's another cube and then the pyramid in this here. So if I left select something, delete that, and copy, enter, and drag that one up, and then left click, copy, enter, and drag that one up, and uh, so we haven't created a sphere, but we can sort of left click, drop out this menu and say a sphere. And it wants to know the center of the sphere. And this is where this control click, I don't know if this is too complicated too early, but if I control click on top of this uh, pyramid, now I'm locked that distance and it's asking me for, I think it's gonna ask me for the radius. So if I want a 100 millimeter on the diameter, I'm gonna do 50, and once the radius is 50, my finger slips on here, I need to do this, right. And then that would be uh, the shape from the thing. So that's mainly just what we want to cover today. Um, a lot of these tools, as I repeat them, throughout the various weeks will become obvious the idea of layers, snaps, turning the snaps on at the bottom corner here and just creating geometry and putting in the model. Um, the left click and the right clicking of Rhino just takes a while to get used to it, but just um, left click is to sort of create geometry, right click is to sort of finish command to, to orbit. Um, it sort of depends what you're doing, what the left and right clicking uh, is at that time but hopefully you'll be able to follow this video and draw that geometry. So.